time that one minute is up, I would like to introduce to your stage one of the KDE developers that I look up to. He's a guy that I had the pleasure of giving an award to uh, last Real Academy. And as you can see, Volker has decided to not display it anywhere um, in his room as a, as a way of being proud of it. So, Volker, would you like to unmute yourself as an official introduction? Okay, thank you, David. Um, yeah, hello, everyone. Um, three years ago uh, at the Academy, I showed you um, KDI Itinerary. Uh, our digital travel assistance app. Last year, I, um, I talked about how we can use um, Wikidata and OpenStreetMap in, in our applications. Uh, and this time, we are putting those two things together and going to look at indoor maps in KDE itinerary. Um, and that is the, the problem we are dealing with specifically. Um, if you're looking on, on normal maps at complex buildings, uh, like in this example, um, this is uh, Berlin Central Station, um, that consists of um, five relevant floors. Um, two of them have railway tracks, one of them has uh, bus stops and, and tram uh, lines, and three of them have shops and stuff, right? But if you look at that, it's all meshed together. You, you don't see any of that. Um, but still, that building is large enough and complex enough um, that you would want a map to, to find your way around. Um, so we need something, something better than that. Um, and I mean, conceptually, that, that is fairly easy, right? We, we just split this in, into different floor levels and display them separately. Uh, and that would already get us like 90% there. Um, and we have uh, another important aspect to look at, uh, and that is how you change between floors. Um, that might sound simple at, at first, but if you think about uh, traveling with uh, heavy luggage or a stroller or with an injury or in a wheelchair, um, some of the usual ways to change floors, like stairs, are possibly an, an obstacle that is rather hard to overcome, right? So you want to know exactly uh, what you're going to face in a, in a large and complex building. Um, unlike with, with regular outdoor maps, unfortunately, um, this isn't something that you can just find as a ready-to-use component and integrate in your application. Um, so we have to do the, the usual thing in that case, um, build it ourselves. Um, so let's get started. Um, the first thing we need um, is obviously the data. Um, and OpenStreetMap is the, the obvious source for that. Um, luckily, their data model already considers um, the, uh, the indoor uh, scenario. Um, and that is mainly done in two, uh, two forms. Um, there's the level tag that allows us to uh, associate each element in, in OpenStreetMap with a floor level. Um, and that is a fairly simple thing to, to do in OSM. And then there's the much more complex set of indoor tags, um, which allows to model uh, like room level details, walls, uh, doors, uh, pillars, uh, whatever you might find there. Um, that is a lot harder to, um, to edit. Um, if we then look at what we find in practice in the OSM data, um, we notice that the indoor uh, data doesn't have the same global high quality coverage that, for example, the, the street data has. Um, we'll mainly find that in a number of showcase buildings. Um, and fortunately for us, uh, in a number of countries in um, a large amount of train stations. 
Um, so specifically in France, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, um, even smaller train stations have a sufficient level of detail. Um, airports, unfortunately, they are, with a few exceptions, uh, done rather poorly on that, so far at least. Um, but the, the train stations is uh, at least uh, uh, covering one of our major use cases itinerary. So that's um, good enough to get started. Um, the next step is we need to separate that data by, by floor levels. Um, that's easy for elements that just exist on a single floor. Um, but then we also have to consider things that connect floors like um, stairs and, and escalators. Um, and that is unfortunately the, the level of floor level separation where most of the existing um, proof of concept indoor things based on top of OSM uh, stop. But that doesn't produce what you would expect as a, as a user. So we have to look at a number of um, additional things there. Um, one, one such problem, for example, are um, stairs that have in the middle one or two smaller platforms. Those, um, those get assigned um, like floor uh, 0.5 or 0.3. Uh, but that isn't something you want to see in a map, right? The, uh, some pseudo floors only containing tiny platforms that is completely useless. So we need to allocate that to the, to the floor, the actual floor besides those and, and stack them in the right order. Um, we have to deal with elevators that cross a large number of floors. Um, we have to, to collect uh, some, some information from other sources in, in OSM, uh, for example, to have to be building hull um, model correctly. Um, but uh, that still doesn't uh, 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 solve all the problems. Um, if you remember the, the uh, Berlin Central Station example from the beginning, that has five floors that matter to us, and then there's a bunch of office floors on the top that aren't accessible to normal travelers, so they are completely pointless. Um, immediately next to that station, there's a number of high-rise buildings that contribute a number of extra floors. We also don't care about those. And underneath, you might find service tunnels or water canals and stuff like that. So all of that we need to uh, filter out. Uh, so we end up with a, with a number of rules and heuristics to, to actually get to the um, Low level separation that we want. Um, that's an example of uh, incomplete data. Um, this is uh, the main railway station in Brussels. And you might look at that and consider it completely useless. You rather should look at that as an OSM contribution opportunity. Because fixing that is surprisingly easy. Um, you just need a few small additions with um, resetting the level tags um, to turn this from useless to something that, that we can actually work with. Um, adding extra text to existing elements in, in OSM is uh, as easy as it gets in, in terms of OSM editing, right? So you don't need to measure anything or create any new geometry. Um, that makes it uh, hopefully uh, fairly quick to to improve the data quality in the in the places where we need it. Um, so now that we have covered the the data aspect, uh, we need to get things on uh, onto the screen. Um, in terms of uh, geometry primitives, this is actually fairly simple. Um, we only have uh, icons, labels, lines, and polygons um, uh, to consider. Right? So QPainter can handle that um, out of the box. Uh, label placement is another interesting thing to look at um, that requires remembering um, quite some geometry math. Um, but that is a problem that also all the outdoor map implementations have. So we can just borrow it from there. Uh, and there's, there's some fun to be had with um, 
uh, numeric stability um, as we are working with like centimeter resolution on a global scale. So very easy to run out of the uh, outer space in, in normal data types there. Uh, but the real complexity of, of the rendering is in the hundreds of rules that describe how specific things should look like uh, in terms of fill and stroke patterns, in terms of um, stacking order, and in terms of um, level of detail information, so at which zoom level you want to, to see them and, or hide them. Um, doing that in code is possible, but um, rather annoying. Um, it's um, uh, fortunately better alternatives um, that allow us to specify this in a, in a declarative way. Um, one such uh, thing is uh, map CSS inspired by um, CSS cascading style sheets from the web. Um, and just unlike there where we match against HTML DOM nodes, here we match against, H uh, against uh, OSM elements. In this example, uh, we are looking for uh, railway tracks. And then, as you know it from CSS, right, we can specify a number of um, attributes that uh, define the visual appearance. Um, like all the, the stroke and fill and outline things you might expect there. Um, one interesting thing is how we can specify sizes there. So this can be done in, in like screen pixels, um, which means it's a fixed size independent of the zoom level, or it can be in, in physical dimensions, and that then means physical dimensions in the real world, right? So a railway track in Central Europe uh, would usually be 1.435 meters wide. Um, and then it keeps that, that width uh, independent of the zoom level. Um, or as it's done here, we can reference existing uh, tags in the OSM element uh, where that information is already present, right? So we can just uh, uh, access that from, from the slide. And with that, we have an actual, actually quite powerful system to define how things should look like on the map. Um, all of that exists in the uh, very creatively named uh, KOSM indoor map repository um, as a C++ library that contains all the data processing and, um, and rendering code and QNL components to, to integrate that easily in, in applications. Um, for the data, that uses the same uh, backend server for OSM raw data tiles um, as Marble as well. Um, that's something I, I briefly mentioned last year um, where we were still working on a, on a new system for that. Uh, meanwhile, that has been, has been deployed. Um, and now has uh, truly worldwide coverage um, and updates daily from the, uh, the upstream OSM data. Um, it then might still take a week or two until this has, until changes have propagated for all the, the caching layers. Um, but compared to what we had uh, previously, uh, this gives you very, very quick updates uh, when, when fixing the data. Um, we have the floor level separation I mentioned implemented in there. Um, we have interfloor navigation, which means if you click on a stair or an uh, escalator, then you jump to the floor that connects to. If you click on an uh, elevator, you can select which floor uh, to go to. Um, the map CSS uh, engine in there is uh, is uh, doing everything at runtime, right? There's no pre-compilation, uh, which is very convenient for, uh, for development. Um, you can just live edit uh, the style shade reload and immediately see, um, see your changes on the map. And it is very powerful for, for applications as well, um, as you can very easily customize the, the visual appearance, right? So you can hide stuff that is irrelevant for your use case, or you can highlight things um, that you're currently working with or 
arbitrarily customize that to the, uh, the user preferences. Um, and then we have built some, some things on top of that that I'm going to show you in a, in a minute. Um, I don't think we have the time for going deeper in the implementation, so I skip that part uh, and instead uh, show you some screenshots. Um, so this is again Berlin Central Station, uh, three of the five relevant floors. Um, I mean, there's still a whole lot of stuff in there that isn't ideal um, due to issues in the styling, due to issues in the rendering, and uh, issues in the data. But this is a huge improvement over having everything meshed together, right? You can now clearly see um, the railway platforms. Uh, you can uh, see the uh, stairs and escalators and elevators. You can identify the various shops and restaurants. Um, this is actually useful to find, uh, find your way around. Um, and it's, it's using the breeze dark style. So you will see some of the other screenshots using the light one. So that shows the, uh, the flexibility in, uh, in the styling we have. Um, one note about performance. Um, this uh, image was actually an accident. Um, I miscalculated some coordinates and ended up loading the entire city of Hamburg into this. Um, uh, surprisingly, this loads within a few seconds um, on the workstation. And while it doesn't really have 60 FPS uh, rendering anymore, it's still somewhat usable. Um, and that just shows that there is more than enough room in there to run this for, or run this on a building scale on a, on a low-end smartphone. Um, right, and then let's get to some of the things um, that we, we built on, on top of the, uh, on the mapping data. Um, I already mentioned that um, that we uh, identify escalators and elevators and stairs for, um, for interfloor navigation. Uh, another thing that is um, particularly important for the itinerary use case um, is identifying airport gates and railway platforms, because that is ultimately where we need to go based on our uh, itinerary. Right? Um, airport gates are um, fairly easy to handle. Um, in the real world, they usually manifest as a door. Uh, OSM models them as a, as a point. Um, so there isn't much we, we need to uh, look for or reassemble. Um, railway platforms are the total opposite. Um, they can be several hundred meters in, in length and consist of an arbitrarily complex geometry for the platform itself, um, one or more tracks next to it, uh, uh, it that, uh, which might be split in various subparts. The platform itself might be uh, split in several sections. Um, depending on country and operators, there's different naming schemes for platforms and, and tracks, um, some of them internal, some of them publicly visible, right? So we want, of course, the, the publicly visible ones. Um, and uh, for more fun, uh, for historic reasons, OSM has uh, different tagging schemes for that. Um, so the data isn't always in a uniform format. So we need to find all those parts and puzzle them together somehow. Um, and the last part is um, opening hours. Um, so if, so itinerary knows when you are going to be at the railway station and for how long. Um, and if we know when like the ticket shop or the coffee shop are open, right, we can, can highlight the ones that are open or hide the ones that aren't open while you're there, um, as there's no point to go in searching for coffee and then finding the, the place closed, right? Um, and here are the pictures for that. Um, on the left-hand side, we see a, a train connection in uh, Cologne Central Station, I think. So the, um, we are arriving on, on track six, uh, marked in green. 
we are departing from uh, track seven marked in red. Um, and already that, that bit of highlighting uh, adds value here, right? Because you immediately see that your connecting train departs from, from the same platform, just on the, on the opposite side. Um, so even if, if you have a very short connection, that should be easily doable, right? There's no problem with stairs or elevators involved. Um, and that way you can see that. On the right-hand side, we have um, uh, obviously different ways on how we um, make use of the opening hours. So there's uh, this green line here, open for two, uh, two more hours of the, I think we have the ticket shop selected there. Um, that is a simple uh, human readable description of the current state. Um, for a bigger picture, we have the um, this, uh, table view. Uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned, we can um, also use that to like gray out or hide elements on, on the map. Um, since that opening hours format uh, of o OSM is used in a number of other places as well, uh, the whole code for that is in a separate library, K opening hours. Uh, and that contains both the uh, evaluation engine for those expressions, um, as well as the building blocks for, for the uh, user interface. Um, that might be something uh, of interest for Plasma browser integration, for example, um, as uh, websites of shops or restaurants uh, contain that information often in a, in a machine readable as, uh, way as well that this can consume. Um, right, and then we have a, another thing added there, uh, and that is additional uh, data sources uh, that we can integrate into the map. Um, the first one is uh, the operational status of elevators and escalators. Um, that's something we get from Accessibility Cloud which is a free software service uh, that aggregates that from uh, hundreds of different sources um, and then provides a unified API for that. Um, that's operated by the same people that do realmap.org uh, and they can kindly allow us to, to use this for this purpose as well. Um, in the screenshot on the, on the left, we see that in action, right? We have two escalators that are operational and we have uh, three Elevators that are currently operational, uh, all marked in green. And we have one uh, elevator that is currently uh, out of service. Um, if you are relying on an elevator to, to change floor levels, right, that is, of course, a very crucial information. Um, and knowing that building, right, or not knowing that building, you might expect you can just take the elevator next to it. Um, that, however, will get you to different platforms. Uh, so depending on where you uh, need to go, you might need to uh, use the elevator on the right as an alternative. That is, of course, stuff you need to know somehow, right? And uh, they, the indoor map uh, provides you with that information. Um, the other um, real-time data source we, we integrate is uh, positions of uh, rental bikes and e-scooters. Uh, so if you use those to get to and from the station, uh, it's of course good to know where, where they are placed and if there's uh, some available at all. Uh, so here on the right, we see uh, three rental bikes uh, currently available at this uh, uh, bike parking space. Um, yeah, that's, that's the stuff we have implemented so far. Um, and that is basically just the map display, right? This is an indoor navigation. For navigation, we are, we are missing two crucial parts still. Uh, one is localization, finding out where you are, and routing, finding out how you get from A to B. Um, localization is usually done with GPS uh, outdoors, uh, but that hardly ever works indoors. Uh, and even if it would, uh, we still have the problem that we need to uh, map um, altitude in 
like altitude above sea level to floor level somehow. Uh, instead, indoor localization is usually done by um, measuring the signal strengths of uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi beacons, and then guessing based on that. Um, that is probably something to look at rather on the plasma mobile uh, system level rather than on an application level, uh, as that needs somewhat low level access to the, the radio devices. Um, and it is something that is very hard to work on while you're stuck at home. Um, that needs some time on site to actually make experiments and, and measurements. Uh, not so for routing, that is something you could work on uh, comfortably from your desk at home. Um, routing on the, uh, on the outside usually is, uh, is done using uh, graph algorithms. Right? So we use the, uh, the streets as a, as a kind of a graph and then apply like shortest path algorithms on that. Massively simplified, but that's the basic idea. Um, with the indoor data, we have the problem that we don't have an, a complete graph of rays that connect every possible place we want to go. Uh, instead, we also have um, areas uh, where we, we just have a polygon describing an area um, on which you could walk. Um, so we need to kind of mix those two data types um, and Build a, a routing system that can can handle with, uh, handle those uh, those two, and of course we need to consider the uh, the floor level changes uh, specifically as well. Um, so that's an, an interesting problem to work on um, if you like geometry and uh, and graph problems. Um, and uh, then there's a few more things uh, to, to look out for, I think. Um, the thing that actually got the whole, this whole work started is um, I wanted to have the train coach positions properly displayed on the map. If you have a seat reservation in a train, right, that is the information you want to, in order to know where you have to go. Um, now we have the map, and itinerary also has the coach layout. Uh, the problem is bringing those two together, uh, as we are missing one crucial piece of information, uh, namely in which direction the train needs to go onto the map. I hope that we'll eventually find a solution for that, and then uh, finally get that implemented as well. And that, of course, is also a prerequisite for, for proper routing, uh, because we, of course, need to know where exactly we, we should end up in a, in a train station to, to reach our train, right? Um, another thing to, uh, to look into is um, uh, is uh, well generalizing that and using it for, for other building types, right? I have mainly focused on train stations and airports here for, for obvious reasons. Um, You'll find very good indoor data also in um, museums, universities, or shopping malls, for example. So there could be uh, value in, in creating a, like a standalone indoor map app for, for Plasma Mobile. Um, we currently have a standalone app that is, uh, well, that is purely uh, aimed at developing, so for, for testing and uh, style sheet changes and so on. Uh, we might want to, to build something proper on, on top of that. And then finally, there's the, um, the relation to Marble. Um, Marble has all the, the outdoor mapping uh, done uh, already, right? Um, and it has a ton more features than, uh, than this has. Uh, on the other hand, we are missing the, uh, the indoor mapping there. And there's a few other uh, interesting pieces in here that uh, that Marvel might benefit from, uh, like the geometry reassembly from the uh, from the raw data tiles. Um, Marvel doesn't do that yet. Um, uh, the map CSS engine or some of the the performance work. Um, so I think we should at least explore how we can 
uh, or if there's ways to to share more of the uh, the work and the the code between those two. Yeah, and I think that's uh, that's it. Thank you for listening. And are there any questions? So right now we have no questions, but people, please do ask him. I shall ask some questions to Volker so he doesn't have a chance to relax. Um, so you, you've talked mostly about drawing your maps and the actual rendering. Could you talk us through your workflow from a user from going from booking a ticket to using a map? How does it integrate from a key itinerary point of view? Um, sure. So um, we have we don't have ticket booking integrated uh, at this point. So you book that on a on the like the Deutsche Bahn website or whatever the do you even have trains where you live? I don't know. Um, um, so assume you, you booked a ticket on the on the vendor website, you get an email with a PDF containing that ticket. Uh, you're of course using Kmail, so Kmail recognizes that that ticket um, and shows you what's in there in a compact form and offers you to add that to your calendar or the itinerary app directly. Um, then in the itinerary app, um, you have a timeline that contains your, your train trip or possibly multiple train trips, right, if you have connections in between. And for the, uh, for the stations, itinerary offers you to look at the, at the map. So if you want to know how complex your change is, right, so if you need to change five floors or if, the, if it's on the next platform, right, you just open the, uh, the map there and, uh, and look at that. Um, there is, of course, a lot of room there to integrate uh, proper navigation once once we have that. But right now, it's it's basically just an option. Um, open the map at the stations I'm going to travel to. Um, give me a second. I might be able to demo that. Oh, live demos! That's brave. We want to see it now. Yeah, I had that prepared for the uh, for the map. I just need to look if I have an. Yeah, I have one for itinerary with demo data that I can show you. Okay, and if people do have questions, please do ask them. It's your only chance. Volker might be gone from there for after this on a big holiday using K itinerary, and we will not be able to find him. Uh, for that, we first need to implement the uh, uh, vaccination certificates as well, but that is ongoing. Uh, so let me see if this works. So this is a maybe slightly distorted KDI itinerary because I tried to scale it up so you can have a chance to read it. Um, and the the card in here, right? That is the, the train ticket um, from Berlin to the PIM meeting in Osnabrück. And just by clicking here, I get the the station, uh, uh, the the map already pre-selected on the platform I'm departing from, and uh, it even has the arrival platform here. That is not for the uh, not for connecting trip that I booked, but it is for the uh, public transport uh, connection that itinerary recommended me to get to the station from home. Um, and I can do the same at the um, arrival location. Um, and there again, it has the the right platform already selected. Uh, let me go back to Berlin. That is the slightly more complex station. Uh, so here I can just by clicking on the uh, on the steps go down right and uh, navigate through the the station. Um, or take the elevator back up. We have one question from the chat, and a question from Pure Tryout is: Do you have any plans to integrate with KD Connect? And it's a maddening situation where you can 
plan a route on your desktop and then do your actual navigation on your phone? Um, we do have integration with KD Connect. I mean, that's how KML, for example, sends your train ticket to, to the phone. Uh, so that goes directly via KD Connect as one of the options. What we don't have is uh, that specifically for the uh, for like uh, route planning or, or anything like that. Um, that is a good idea, Thrill. Um, but I think the first thing we would need for that as well is uh, is proper routing. Okay, now one more question. Oh, I've got two more questions. So the first question, how can a user, anyone get this project? How can uh, we run it? And on what platforms? Um, oh, yeah, there is. Uh, um, I mean, this is uh, a Kirigami application. Well, itinerary is a Kirigami application, right? So, and that has this integrated. Uh, so that's available. Um, on any kind of Linux platforms, uh, and it's available in the F-Droid nightly build and release build repositories of KD. Uh, and we are working on also getting it into Google Play. And that gives me an opportunity to um, advertise the uh, Android release uh, talk I have on Friday, um, which deals with exactly how we get this uh, properly deployed on Android. OK, one more question's coming. And it is from Hudson. Would gamification fit into your project vision to encourage users to reduce their environmental impact? Um, I'm, I mean, uh, environmental impact uh, is, uh, I would certainly see in scope. We have a statistics, uh, I'm not sure if it's, oh, no, I, I don't think I'm presenting anymore. Um, we have a statistics view that shows you um, like your CO2 emissions uh, based on mode of transport and that kind of stuff. So there is, I mean, I, I can't from the top of my head come up with a good gamification idea to, to leverage that. Uh, but yeah, I think I, I would see that definitely in scope. Uh, we try to- we, You have all your data so other people could, you have all your data so other people could then take out those libraries and build something else if they wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we definitely try to collect the uh, CO2 emissions wherever we have them. And we have estimates based on mode of transport and distance to get it where we don't have them. Right, I would like everyone to give Volker a big round of applause, obviously virtually, with a clapping emoji or otherwise. And I'm sure Volk will be around all week for questions. Exactly. So if there's uh, anything else you're interested in, um, just ping me on chat.